Priyanka. Welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Brahma Mukherjee, our seminar speaker for this afternoon. As you know, Brahma has been visiting us since uh, September, the beginning of September, uh, from Michigan, where she's head of department and John Kalpras professor of biostatistics. She has had numerous um, awards, but most recently, which I thought I wanted to highlight, I think we did circulate the news, she was elected to the US Academy of Medicine which is a great honor for our biostatisticians. This is quite rare. So we're very privileged to have her, to have been able to have her among us for the whole of the term. And I know she's been interacting with many of, of you, uh, students, staff, uh, because she, I think one characteristic of Rama is she has such a, she's interested in, in many areas of biostatistics, um, in particular, we'll hear about electronic health record, biases, missing data, and, and all the pitfalls of the observational data. But she has worked on many other areas from genomics to COVID and so on. So she's uh, incredibly active and, uh, and we're very privileged to have her among, among us this uh, term. So, um, you know, please, of course, there'll be time for questions, but please follow up also with, with her because she's very often in the unit and, and she's very interested in all sorts of aspects of uh, biostatistical and also about, you know, the role of women in, in biostatistics. She's been a big champion for the woman course. So if you want to talk about also career advice and things like that, I'm sure she's very open uh, to that. So... Without further ado, the floor is yours, Brahma. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Uh, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I just want to really applaud Peter and the organizing committee for this student uh, PhD student day that we had at BSU. I could not have found a better day to give this talk because the whole day seemed to be like a celebration of our uh, profession. And I can see that the future of statistics is bright. <laughs> and so, so uh, now talking about uh, the past, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but but I, I just want to really, really say that um, uh, three months ago, I moved into Cambridge. And I moved into like, you know, I, I moved into Cambridge with a lot of trepidations about how my life is going to go. And three months later, I think I'm, I have one more suitcase. And <laughs> please, please do not ask me what is in there and what I bought. Uh, but what I really want to say that I have one more suitcase, but really many, many more friends. So um, I just wanted to thank everybody who spent time in talking with me. And I really have I walked into, have been to many places, as Sylvia says, that I like to travel. But I have really walked into an environment more intellectually vibrant, socially conscious, and welcoming. So as I stand up to present my talk today, I just want to thank you. Thank you for all those conversations about T20 cricket matches. <laughs> it is something you do not get to talk about in the US. To them, it's an insect. Uh, so, and also currently the FIFA World Cups. When I'm sneaking in and looking at scores, I know that other people are doing that too. I'm not the only one. So I, I, I really want to thank the friendship that I have built in this community. And uh, I want to thank you for making it, as my daughter will say, that the bestest possible sabbatical ever. <laughs> so uh, today I want to talk about uh, my talk and, and, and my research and tell you a story about like, you know, my sort of contribution over the last 10 years almost and those online. I also want to thank you for joining. Uh, I, before I started giving this talk, somehow I have made this reputation of doing a three act talk. Someone asked me, are you going to do the three acts? And so I said, okay, I'm not going to disappoint you. I'm going to do the three acts. And the three acts come from the fact that my father is an actor. And he is really not approving of what I do, but sometimes he can be helpful. <laughs> he said that uh, he listened to one of my talks videotaped during Zoom, and he said that, uh, have you ever heard of the word pause? 
<laughs> no, right? We really do not pause. We try to cover as much as possible. We have 15 minutes and the clock is running. And so he said, why don't you really divide your talk into three acts? And after each act, you get a musical interlude. <laughs> so I'm going to try that. I'm, I might fail, but this is a safe space, so I'm going to try. So I'm, I'm, I'm so for the and, and then and it's sort of a palate cleanser as well because the three parts of the talk are quite different. And so I'll try this. And the first part is being part of data making. And this has become very close to my heart because as statisticians, we always work on data collected by others. How is it to take charge of data collection? Think about studies. And so I want to talk about that. The second act, the meaty act, where all the characters enter and what happens, action filled, is the data quality and biases in EHR. And I have spoken a lot about this in recent uh, uh, talks. And then the third and final act, I want to talk about why you should invest in statistical research, giving an example of all of this architecture that we built in Act 1 and Act 2 without thinking about COVID, how that became extremely relevant when COVID hit. So you never know what's coming, and that is exactly why it is really, really important to invest in statistical methodology. They, you do not know when you are going to need them. So no work is complete without thanking your phenomenal collaborators. And I in particular want to thank Lauren Beasley, my postdoctoral fellow, uh, my collaborator, Lars Fritzsche, who is a geneticist, uh, my also collaborator, Max, who is a PhD student in epidemiologist, uh, epidemiology, and also Xu Shi, who is a, a really phenomenal collaborator in EHR and causal inference. So, this all started in about a decade ago when Michigan started, like many other universities in the United States, the Precision Health Initiative. And we prefer to call it Precision Health as opposed to Precision Medicine because we are sitting in School of Public Health and most of the time our job is to really do precision prevention and improve human health. So what we did, data, Collecting, curating, linking, assembling, amassing data was a big part of this process. We wanted to create a digital ecosystem so that it can act as an accelerator and incubator for ideas in the campus. It's nobody's proprietary data. It is not focused on any particular disease. And we want to create a data ecosystem which is sort of disease agnostic, investigator agnostic, it can be used for validation of hypo hypothesis, or it can be interrogated for generation of hypothesis. And I was not in charge of data linkage. I was actually in charge of cohort development, who should we recruit, and how should we build this digital ecosystem for the last four years. So I really care about this study. This study is called the Michigan Genomics Initiative, where we recruited patients when they were waiting for surgery. So this is very, very important. We have lots and lots of data, but where did we collect it? We collected it when people were waiting for surgery. This was a very brilliant consent form. Those of you who are interested in collecting EHR data, we hear a lot about privacy uh, and security consideration. What we asked uh, patients and participants to do is to give us permission to link their genetics with electronic health records but also, this is very key, to link with anything from their social security number or like a national identifier number, any information, and also call back potential. We could call them back for new research or relevant clinical finding. So this is something game changing. And uh, you know, several people from the anesthesiology department and my uh, collaborator, Gonzalo Abigasis, envisioned this study in a very forward looking way in 2012. So this is 10 years ago. So over time, we have cre created and curated this data set. One key element of this data set or electronic health record is medical phenotyping. And so there is a huge community of people who are medical informatician, as well as just clinical informatics warehouse who are curating this data from lab and test results from ICD.
in to come, uh, come up with phenotypes, which you, I'm going to use. And these phenotypes, in defining these phenotypes, several sources of the data, clinical narratives, imaging, all of these are being used. And two parts of the electronic health records do who are those of you who are quite familiar. One is structured, the other is unstructured. And the unstructured part is not being used in today's talk. We are using mostly the structure content, the lab values, the prescriptions, the questionnaires, the treatments, and so on. So I'm not going to talk too much about how the phenotyping or the medical informatics work goes. But I want to say that at the end of the day, we have a very large data, a very large data set with six, more than like 16 million medical encounters and more than 20 million genetic variants per sample with 100,000 people. This is sort of a dream situation for any statistical methods application, large N, large P. And then we also collected different other forms of data. Because we do believe that an individual's existence is not just codified by EHR and genetics. So we collected epidemiologic survey data. We collected family history data. Uh, Geocoded residential information was used to map environmental data and social factors as well. On part of the population, we also have smartphone and mobile health data as well. So during COVID, we did not stop. During COVID, we actually realized that doing survey during COVID is a good idea. People are sitting at home, they're playing with their phones, and they're also interested in contributing to health research. We also figured out that how to really recruit patients remotely. So here you can see that we are, being, uh, we are mailing spit kits to our participants that expanded our geographical reach. So we actually learned a lot of things during COVID in patient recruitment and what kind of data we collected. So what we created before prior to COVID was really this integrated data ecosystem where we had the core elements, which is electronic medical records and genetics. Then we linked to other internal data warehouses. For example, in Michigan, dental records are not a part of EPIC. So it's a huge challenge to actually link the dental records to the medical records. Then we actually purchase some data, for example, medical claims. And you have to recognize in the United States, we do not have national health services. You do not know how lucky you are in terms of integrated electronic health record data. And here we only have a snapshot at a single hospital. This is a major methodological challenge with the HR data in the United States. And so, and then we link to other registry. For example, we link to uh, National Death Index. We link to Cancer Registry, and we also use geocoded residential information to map the ecological variables, neighborhood index, what kind of crime rates, and so on, air pollution levels. This is ten years. One slide. Every project involved lots and lots of people. And this was something that we are really proud of, of what we created at Michigan. So when COVID happened, we actually could layer this integrated system where we had EHR genetics with COVID vaccination data, outcome data on severity, and now on long COVID. We immediately did a symptom survey when in March of 2020, we did not know anything we reached out to our participants. This is the catchment. This is the community we serve. We care about these people. And we wrote one of the very first uh, papers on how Michigan residents are feeling about COVID exposure and COVID risk factors. So we then actually questioned this survey uh, two years later, that do we really needed that survey? Was EHR enough or we need to survey the participants to know contemporary information or their medical record was enough. So as statisticians, I think that we often do not get involved in big initiatives on campus about collecting data, but I think it's really, really critical how you collect data and being involved in this. So one good news that you know, universities always want to invest in resources so that they can return on, see return on investment. So recently we are funded because this is electronic health record data. We wanted to really do a population-based cohort where we have prospectively collecting, and I mean, my main interest in beyond COVID is uh, cancer, 
It's a cohort study of 100,000 patients from six environmental injustice hotspots in Michigan, where we are recruiting patients free of cancer, 25 to 44, and collecting all kinds of genomics data in the next 10 years in waves. And this study has the design that not just cancer, with this omics marker, different other diseases are going to happen. This is a true prospective cohort, and we are going to have the power to study them. And maybe by the time that I retire, this study will not have enough cancer or enough phenotypes, but this is a legacy where you are contributing. And I'm really, really proud that along with my collaborators from epidemiology and environmental health, a statistician can also be PIs of data collection processes. So owning my own data, thinking about all the things that you have seen, lack of replication, whether cancer happens first or omics changes happen first, but prospectively to characterize changes in intermediate biomarkers for cancer in particularly un underserved communities have, was our, one of our dreams and we were able to get that funding. So act one summary, at the end of 10 years, we have a rich data set at Michigan with large N and large P, different lenses to explore this data. And we have designed our questionnaires in such a way that we can actually participate in UK Biobank and other Biobank's meta-analysis. It's a shared resource for the institution. It's not just for one person. And as I said, because we had this ecosystem, I'll show you later on how we were able to write immediately, nimbly pivot on this ecosystem because we had the methods, we had the tools, we had the data to really address some emerging challenges in COVID. So my mantra before I pause the uh, first interlude, create your own studies, own your data. So those of you who are not from the US, any guesses what this music was? It's actually from a popular game show called Jeopardy. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, this is the thinking music when you come up with the really, really difficult questions. For this. <laughs> uh, so uh, act two and act two, so it, this is really the statistical part. Uh, electronic health records data, some people like it, some people hate it. Um, but there are pros and cons, just like a statistician, and I'm, I'm going to tell you that this is here to stay. I really was very skeptical about EHRs because of various reasons in terms of, I really do not know why a person's observation is there, particularly for the US. I have a very incomplete snapshot. I have incorrect phenotypes. I have all kinds of biases in terms of ascertainment of the individuals. I do not know which population I'm trying to generalize to. And then I really have to go back to my classic uh, epidemiology textbook about representativeness, generalizability, transportability when I'm dealing with this data set. But the pros are we built a cohort of 100,000 people with all of this data in 10 years without that much of an effort. And because that's because patients are coming, it's large in size, it has a quite available. It's the number of variables that you have. You have longitudinal data, but the most important thing, which is extremely empowering, is the ability to call back and reach the community immediately. These are the people who are being served in your catchment, and there is something about immediacy of action happening in the medical phenome, which is quite empowering. So uh, sources of biases in EHR data, and many of many people in the room have worked on many different com uh, components of it, confounding, missing data, different cohorts are quite different, people apply different phenotypic techniques in different cohorts, heterogeneity of the studied populations, imperfect phenotyping, uh, outcome misclassification, I'm going to talk about that, selection bias, 
and all of the above together. It seems like a hierarchy and confluence of catastrophes and statistical disasters. So it's very easy to walk away from it that I'm not going to do this. I'm going to be very purist and not touch this data. But statisticians, when you see imperfection, you have the idea that I'm going to still try. I'm going to still try uh, the best tools from my arsenal. And the four different, three different classes of approaches which have been uh, proposed for correcting biases. And I would really like to emphasize that it's bias reduction, not really bias removal. If somebody says I can remove biases in electronic health record data, I'd be very skeptical. And so you can only reduce the biases. And then there are three classes of methods. One is to collect more data. You have a very non-random sample and non-probabilistic sample. Let us collect more data. And that's through chart review, double sampling, multi-wave sampling. The literature is emerging using negative controls because maybe some same source of biases are affecting other unrelated conditions as well. And then what I'm going to talk about today is posit models for the data contamination process. So in this whole process, I feel like, you know, I graduated from Purdue in 2001, and my tools were very classical and almost antediluvian because I learned how to focus on efficiency, always think about power and efficiency. I think we need to read for big data. We really need to change our mindset and focus on bias because we have tons and tons of data. And so my clinical colleagues, I started giving talks about how small is big data, the cars of large N. My clinical clinic said, what kind of unhappy people are you, you statisticians? Uh, you know, in, in the beginning, you always said we need more data. This is small sample size. Now we have given you lots and lots of data. You just see. So, uh, so but, 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 but there's a point. There's a method in this madness because we have a big non-probabilistic sample here where there are all kinds of biases which are not going away with sample size. So let us say this is bias and it is staying constant. And then you have tons and tons of data, 100,000. Next year, we are going to have 110,000 and so on. The confidence intervals are becoming very, very narrow. So if you have this bias and the length of the credible interval is going, what are we achieving? We are becoming very efficiently precisely wrong. If that's your goal, be my guest. But mm -hmm. then the true parameter is falling outside the narrow confidence interval. It was even better to have less data if you have the same order of bias to protect the confidence interval from going outside. So what should we do? That with, Should we just say that uh, bias is the most important thing? This data is not giving us information. So before doing anything, any machine learning, and we heard a lot about very fancy tools and libraries since morning, when we are amassing different sources of data, we have to ask ourselves the fundamental questions that we walk into STAT 101 and ask each student to think about. Who is in my study and what is the target population of inference from S to P, from statistic to parameter? And I do think that, you know, Michigan is starting a health data science master's. We are really infusing and um, overwhelming our courses with lots and lots of machine learning. And I totally support that. We, our students should learn more computation, should learn. And this has really opened up. We have sort of really in a bold exploration area with statistics and data science. But I do think that computer science departments need to reciprocate a little bit. At least one course in sampling and design will save us from lots and lots of bad signs. So uh, I, I love my CS friends. I always argue with them. But I, I really, really, really need to think about how data are made. It's a big data, but as David Cox would say, so what? And what is happening? We are hearing a lot about fairness of algorithms these days. But if you have biased data collection, measurements, and exclusion <laughs> then if you train the fanciest algorithm on bad data, nothing can rescue you from bad data. And are, you are going to make incorrect policy decisions that's going to increase the disparity and flow back into your biased data collection. And the invisible are always going to remain invisible. So this has societal costs, this vicious cycle 
of bad data. So let us come back to Michigan Genomics Initiative, uh, recruited through anesthesiology. And when you looked at the data, roughly 50% people had cancer. So this is obviously not representative of the population. And if you think about it, why this enrichment that if you have cancer, you undergo surgery or interventional procedure more often. So there is a natural, uh, natural enrichment. And also, if you have cancer, you tend to come to the academic medical center for your care where the cancer center is. So that led to both of them led to this enrichment. So many of you in the room are very familiar with UK Biobank. So if I compare Michigan Genomics Initiative with respect to UK Biobank, in terms of prevalence of different diseases, I can see enrichment in every disease category. And that's only to be expected because this is a hospital-based control, uh, hospital-based collection, whereas UK Biobank is healthy population. So there is maybe different kind of biases, but you see that I cannot really do meta-analysis and estimate prevalences. So prevalence estimate is gone, but can I use it for something? My geneticist friends are very bold. So in the beginning, I did not want to touch this data. I actually had a bet with my colleague, Gonzalo Abegas, is a fantastic scientist, that this is garbage in, garbage out. You're not going to learn anything from this data. I actually told him I'll give him 2% of my salary. So we still said that, okay, let us go ahead and still look at the data. Let us do some genetics work because in genetics, people have actually done large meta-analysis and have very good idea about the, what the truth is for some of the genetic GWAS related loci. So for the first four or five years, we wrote many, many genetics papers on this data. <clears throat> and what I saw, was really shocking to me. What I saw in that cancer after cancer, there was this on the x-axis, I have plotted the log odds ratio from GWAS catalogs, which are multi-million dollar studies, years of war. This is a population-based study. And on the y-axis, I have plotted the log odds ratios from Michigan Genomics Initiative. And this was my bet that I, be, I believe that even if the p-values and rankings were fine, the point estimates are not going to agree because these two populations are quite different. But then I see a Lynx concordance coefficient of 0.91 that they are quite concordant. So what is going on here? After the genetics papers, these were the two questions we really wanted to understand. Why? Why is a biased sample enriched for cancer giving me identical results to the population-based GWAS? And then also different people have different length of stay in their EHR. Are we capturing all of the diseases? Are we accurately capturing all of the cancers or, or, or any other diseases? So we wanted to really model the selection and the misclassification jointly. So we want to know what is happening in between the visits, right? Because again, I, as I mentioned, that we do not have an integrated EHR in the United States. When I go to another healthcare system, I do not know. I'm assuming that I'm fine, but I may not be. So I may not capture some of these diseases. So in statistical language, if I translate this observation window bias, that will mean that I have less than perfect sensitivity. I'm not capturing all of the true diseases. And then I need to ask myself this second question that which population I'm trying to make this inference to? Is it the population I approach for consent or surgical population? Is it Michigan medicine? Is it the US population? How am I going to generalize my, uh, my inference and my estimates to the bigger population? So how to deal with potential selection bias and what kind of data do I have on this external population? Do I have individual level data? Do I have summary level data, which is more realistic for uh, Michigan and US? I want to argue that some of our <coughs> intuitions about misclassification and measurement error does not hold when both forces are at play. So remember how we often write that, uh, oh, our odds ratios get attenuated towards the null, if there is measurement error 
And so if I see something association, it's still okay. So this is a case study where there's a proven association. Women are at lower odds of getting cancer as an overall phenotype. So this is the truth. And what I did here was to introduce selection and misclassification on this truth. And it is true that if the misclassification was not dependent on gender, then I can't, the odds ratios get attenuated. But if the misclassification and selection are both at play and depend on gender, then you can actually get from a completely opposite association that women are at higher odds of cancer. So our classical intuitions often do not hold when selection and misclassification are at play. But it depends on how selection and misclassification is related to what you are interested in, for example, the relationship between gender and cancer in this case. So we needed to really model this. And this is where uh, someone with a PhD for in 2001 uh, will start because we sort of, sort of think not in a algorithmic way, but in a very classical model building way that I'm interested in the true relationship of a random variable D with Z, but then I do not get to observe it. Luck has it that I only get EHR derived disease status, which is an error prone version of D. I'm going to call that D star. And then I do not even get to observe D star on everybody. I only observe it on a selected subsample or S equal to one. And I do not know how D became D star or how S equal to one was selected, but I'm going to assume that they are covariates informing this misclassification process and covariates informing the selection process. So X, Y, and W are going to be covariates informing my misclassification and selection process, and Z is my variable of interest. And there could be overlap between different sets of these covariates. So now, once you have this, you make some progress by writing down the models first, that what do I know? I have a disease risk model, I have a selection model, and then I have two models for sensitivity and specificity, how D is getting contaminated to D star. And I'm assuming that there are predictive covariates. So my question now is that I have observed, and in the genetics papers, what we did was actually forget about this, fit a model of D star thinking that it is D and ignore S equal to one. And this is what we had reported, theta naught tilde and theta tilde Z. That was on the Y axis of the figure that I showed you. But now I want to know when is this the truth? When can I ignore this red part and say, I'm going to be okay, like in that figure. And when I am in deep trouble, we need to study this instead of just hand waving and saying that it works. So how to relate the two? And this is where I think our training, our foundational training in statistics comes in, where we think about a problem and put forward our framework of modeling to establish association between the contaminated model on the selected subpopulation and the true model. So this was after a lot of algebra and two and three months of Lauren's hard work and many, many meetings where we established this relationship between the contaminated model and the true model, which is analytically appealing and tractable. And so what we showed that this relationship holds where this is the specificity model, this is the sensitivity model, and this is the selection model. And these functions are complex functions because you have to actually integrate over the distribution of the X and W and Y uh, uh, given Z. So once you establish this relationship, it looks like that you're moving towards some kind of solution and estimation of the corrected parameters. So here you can see that it's still a very hard problem. One thing you could do, you can say that I'm going to assume one of them constant and think about other or profiling in, in some sense. But what you notice is that if I actually had perfect data with sensitivity and specificity one, and if I did not have sampling bias depending on Z, this will be a logistic model with an offset term. So this is almost like 
case control studies where you are sort of really perturbing your original logistic model with this contamination process or this perturbation process. And so that gave us some idea of how to really do this final estimation, this relationship by fitting a transformed logic model with this different specificity and sensitivity estimates. So what we did was actually really, so this is my problem, that if I fix beta tilde, then I still need to estimate sensitivity. And it all depends on whether you have good Xs, good Ys, and good Ws talking about each of these processes. Nothing in, is free lunch. And so this relationship helped us to design some of these methods that I'm going to talk about. And also we had another method, which is more complex, talking about the misclassification process and the disease risk model joint likelihood and estimate that. But this was the key relationship to just think about the models. And then we look into the EHR to, in search of X, in search of Y, in search of W. And what we see here that some of the variables in the EHR, for example, follow-up time, number of visits, how many diagnosis codes you have are predictive of the sensitivity and the specificity processes um, of, the, of the phenotype. And so after at the, so once we had that relationship, we came up with like three different methods, which one is the naive, and I showed you this cancer and gender example. One was some kind of approximation to the distribution of D star given Z fixing the sensitivity. One is this one, the transform logic link that I talked about that just really perturbing the two entities in a nonlinear model. And then we can see that we actually are able to reduce the bias that was there before and make it closer to the truth. One thing which we noticed, and this is going to come back in explaining why my figure for the GWAS was okay, is that you can reduce or remove bias when your covariate of interest Z is independent of the selection. It makes sense, right? That if, you, if your selection or misclassification is not related to Z or you have conditioned away the dependence, you can retrieve it. But if they are intrinsically tangled, that after condition, you cannot really remove that association, then you are in trouble. So this framework helps us to understand that. But then how do you do the two things together, misclassification and selection? For that, we really appealed and talked to many, many survey researchers. And they told us that it depends. It depends on what kind of information do you have on the external model. Do you have access to, say, a national study with known sampling probability, nationally representative with individual level data? Then you can create individual uh, inverse probability weights in order to make it your sample look like that external probability sample. But many times we do not have the joint individual level data. We only have marginals. We only may have the age distribution or the gender distribution or the stratified distribution then we have to put in weights in order to do, <laughs> mar make the marginals look similar. And there are methods like raking and post-stratification in the survey literature to make that happen. So essentially it boiled down to taking our relationship <laughs> with the transform logic model and then applying weighting to it, depending on what kind of data did we have on the external population. And through several simulation studies, we actually showed that you need to address both. Just addressing <laughs> one is not enough when all of these things are tangled up, the selection process, the misclassification process, and the disease risk association. So after that, of course, you had to do variance. I'm not going to go back. It's like, you know, that's why you have graduate students. And so information matrices and, uh, and lots and lots of calculation for each of these methods, calculating variance. And when you have weights, you are estimating the weights. So the unders are, uh, you, can, you have to incorporate that uncertainty as well. Uh, we checked whether our variances actually match with the empirical variances. And sometimes we saw, saw that they are underestimating because we are ignoring the estimation of weights in terms of our variance calculation. And then we all just did not do point. The point I'm trying to make is that we did not just do bias removal. We also did inference because that's what practitioners need, inference. And this slide, the colors got a little messed up. 
But we saw that if you have, if we did simulations that your p-values are quite distorted if X and Z and the selection process and the misclassification process are related, that they're nowhere, the color is not visible here, but they are quite close in terms of um, the transform logit and the uncorrected. You can get away with your naive analysis if the two processes are independent, but when they are related, the p-value distribution is far from being null, being uniform under the null. So when you have selection bias and when the selection bias and misclassification are related to each other, then you are you can be in deep trouble. So then I went back, like, okay, so why aren't we trying trouble in GWAS? What happens? What is so why are geneticists so lucky? And so what we saw that it's not a blanket solution. So this is one example for age-related macular degeneration, where we saw that the log odds ratios from the meta-analysis and the MGI are not 0.91 correlation, it's 0.55. So nobody gave you the guarantee. And so then we want to see that why, why, why was it? But in a data analysis, you did really do not know whether because it was misclassification why it was because of different phenotyping? Was it because of different sample sizes in the external population and your internal population or all four? You don't know. So nonetheless, we applied our methods to this weighting plus non-logistic non link function. We applied, and what we saw that from 0.55, we get it to 0.7 to the actual gold standard, the concordance coefficient. But not really 0.8 or 0.9. So again, with the information that you have available on the external population and the information that you have about the misclassification process that drives the performance of these methods, there is no like not given that you'd be able to retrieve all of this information. So the summary of ACT2 is that we really, really try to estimate sensitivity specificity using EHR variables without gold standard. We apply to two kinds of literature, the misclassification measurement error literature and the survey literature. And I'd like to say that really posited an inferential strategy where two plus two is larger than four. And now coming back to the GWAS question, now probably the answer is clear to many of you that participation selection is often not related to the value of a single nucleotide polymorphism on your genome that association breaks. And that's why you could retrieve all those log odds ratios in the particular case of cancer. And cancer is a very well-measured phenotype in the EHR um, because it can be verified by several other like treatment and therapies and uh, path reports and so on. So there is recent concern about similar issues in like opposite healthy control bias in UK Biobank that you are not always guaranteed, you are not invincible against these biases. So it's important to study that. So what I'm working on right now is that I showed you a cluster of like problems. In any EHR analysis, there are all of those problems, missing data, confounding, um, selection bias, a homogeneity, a heterogeneity across cohort. So how do we create a framework of multi-factor sensitivity analysis, which is doable, which is feasible? So what I mean, just to give you a snapshot, is that this is not about, this is a statistician's checklist. It's not just about data quality and checking. So what I want to be able to do is to give somebody an option to upload their point estimate and confidence interval and just say, I want to move my R and my the sensitivity, the sampling bias and the uh, sensitivity specificity and see where can your inference go? I want to see that what, it, what does it take to wash away your association? Is it small amount of sampling bias and misclassification which throws off your result or is it really large degree so that I have more faith in my analysis. So I want to use this as a sensitivity analysis tool where I can immediately produce different kinds of how your original confidence interval is and then how does it get distorted with these biases. So we have a package called Samba and I'm very proud of the name selection and misclassification bias adjustment. And so we'd really love if people will use that for GWAS analysis and other analysis. 
And so these are some of the papers that we have written. The last one is actually showing how to get external population data in order to do bias correction. That was Samba. Samba, last time I was giving this talk, somebody said that, why do you use the same music at each act? This should be Samba. And that was Carla from UCL. So Carla, I listened to you. So, uh, so the third thing I want to say is that we had the data, we had the methods, and then came a crisis. And so we have seen that like in, during COVID-19, Fantastic papers have come out of countries which have good integrated data system. And I really want to congratulate like UK for that. Like it has been brilliant and you saved many lives by those fantastic data and superb analysis. And then, but also Israel, right? They have Clalit Health System, which gives you integrated data. Denmark with population registry. These large integrated national data ecosystems are crucial. And US is not a good model. In US, most of the papers have come out of Kaiser Permanente. People are still struggling with getting good nationally representative vaccine effectiveness estimates. We also reiterated some of the foundational concepts of matching, confounding, selection bias, meta inference. You will see that there was a lot of role that statistics played, with regardless of whether we were using predictive machine learning or not. So, when we came to our sort of work, we had thought about, now if you think about what I had worked on and what COVID presented us, is that I changed my D to a COVID-related outcome, and that could be long COVID, that could be hospitalization, and then the risk factor changed. Sometimes it was socioeconomic status, sometimes race, sometimes it was actually pre-existing comorbidities. The physicians were asking us who is at high risk of hospitalization? Can you do a quick scan to see who should we prioritize in terms of keeping our eyes on? So what we were able to do is to first understand in the early days of COVID, and I know many of you are interested in this, is building that selection model of whose data are we seeing, who is getting tested. So we wrote several papers on who is getting tested and characterize the selection model. We also wanted to really characterize associations that Z could be race, socioeconomic status. And this was in the early days of COVID that we showed that there is disparity in terms of COVID outcomes. And over time, everybody's outcome has improved but not in the same rate. And what we showed that in the initial paper, we showed that blacks were at higher risk of ICU admissions and mortality. And one year later, all the bar graphs have gone down thanks to vaccine and medication, but it has not gone down in the same rate. And we could do a proper analysis because we had all of the confounders and many of the confounders and lots of the methods ready for this type of analysis when we're trying to look at the association. These were the early days and we did the first FIWAS and this was later on published, but initially it was really trying to understand who is at high risk? What are you seeing in terms of the past COVID, pre-COVID phenome that who is at high risk of hospitalization? And then we did vaccine effectiveness studies using the Michigan data, we recently, last month, published this long COVID study, which I'm very uh, <clears throat> enthusiastic about. It's using a classic case crossover design in order to sample windows from pre-COVID period and post-COVID period and compare the patterns of pre versus post diagnosis and contrasting that with flu diagnosis or test negative design. So I think that design is very key to a statistician and we have to bring it to the table when we are analyzing this very big data sets. And so I just want to say that having the right tools and the right team at the right time was very crucial. Working with the HR data, as I said, that I really started being a skeptic and then I have been converted to really understanding what can we gain out of it. I really want to think about the data quality pyramid assessment checklist that 
every investigator has to fill out before embarking on this analysis, because otherwise we are giving people weapons of math destruction. I am a data dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Since morning, you have seen brilliant talks by many people in this community who are doing brilliant statistical science. So I just want to thank all of you for hosting me, for giving me space for all those wonderful con conversations. But most importantly, I really want to thank the participants of this study who are giving so much data so that we can make a dent, a little bit of progress with using data to improve human health. And I'll forever be grateful to MRCBSU, Stats Lab, Churchill College for providing me food and shelter. And also, if you are in Ann Arbor anytime, you are welcome to be part of University of Michigan Biostatistics. I hope to build stronger ties with Michigan Biostatistics and MRCBSU. And we can hear the holiday parties next week. We can hear the jingle bells ringing. So you can imagine what my last music is going to be. Thank you so much. I think we will definitely, if we were giving prize to the uh, most uh, entertaining, full of content, beautifully presented talk, I would uh, very happily give back to you. For, to, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's lots in that talk. So questions, comments? Excellent talk, thank you. I have a question, just, I think it's amazing, the, the initiative of, of collecting the data. What was the percentage of people who didn't agree or to, to participate? Yeah, so I think I, I quickly went through that. So 78 <laughs> to 75 to 80% say yes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is very interesting because this is in perioperative when people are waiting for surgery. When you go to other clinics, it actually goes down. So there is something about, so this is why we were actually, I have to be very honest that US has this NIH All of Us initiative, which everybody is very excited about. It is um, really enriched in terms of underserved uh, populations, underrepresented populations, and also a million people, sort of your um, US's response to UK Biobank, that we are going to be bigger and more diverse, uh, but they are also democratizing the use of the data uh, Michigan Genomics Initiative could not be a part of it because of this selection in surgery. Because people felt that, you know, you probably somehow you feel a little bit pressured to sign up. That's why it's 80%. When we go outside the clinic, it's somewhere around 40 to 50%. And what about the people whom you try to contact them later? Yes. Yeah, so all agree to continue, or some of them didn't. So some of them, some of, yeah. So, so the thing is that um, we call back with, for example, this COVID studies, we recontacted. And the first thing we say that 10 years ago, you consented to Michigan Genomics Initiative. And sometimes it's like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. like, really? And some people say, okay, okay, so I'll still do it. And some people say, take my name out of it. And I'd say every call is 5%. But if they don't really reach us and say that we want to drop out, then they stay, yes. Yeah. It's not that much of an attrition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they but there are events where they forget. Yes. Yeah. Have you seen you so we have a question online from Claudia. Claudia, are you able to unmute and say your question? Okay, I will read it out then because she's typed it in the chat. Okay, how can we get an example of a data quality pyramid? to assess the data quality or biases in the RWD. So um, I took out this slide because I already felt like there is too much. Uh, so uh, there are data quality assessment checklists, thank you, Claudia, for that question, by several groups, but mostly from the medical informatics arena, where you basically check the distribution of this variable, what it is supposed to be, are there outliers, are there measurement errors, mostly in terms of data review. 
but not in terms of the, the, the problems that I told you, which are more statistical. And so I think that this is something that we are really actively working on, that some of these missing data, confounding, selection, misclassification, transportability, given your problem, if you try to address seven of them in one analysis, you will have nothing left. So in your problem, what is the most important source of bias? How do you diagnose that? For example, in that genetic study, selection bias was not that important because SNPs do not really influence your selection to participate. But when it's polygenic risk score, which is actually related to probably a disease, then that association, that assumption may not hold. How do you analytically study what is the priority? If two things you were to address, what of those five? We're really working on that. And I hope to give you a better answer next time I present. Thank you very much. We're really looking forward to it. So I'm an epidemiologist at AstraZeneca. And this is a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I bounce on your act one? Because, yeah. you know, <laughs> get your own data. I mean, I think <clears throat> I just wanted to understand the uh, scientific ecosystem in, in Michigan, which allowed, you know, biostatisticians to be on par with uh, all the other actors to, to actually get your own data. I mean, my own experience, and I don't know if other people would have, is that it is really hard. I mean, say in the UK, I would say epidemiologists control the data acquisition. And whilst they are you know, whilst they are conscious of the interest of biostatistics, it's very rare that you are absolutely PI on par, um, only in some circumstances. Maybe it's growing, but I just wondered how we could help that. I totally agree with you. Um, you know, it's built on trust, it's built on past of collaboration, whatever. But but let's say the system, I just was wondering with the ecosystem of the either university or the funding mechanism or something it was uh, helping it. This is something we should try to, you know, that story and that success story of the Michigan, we should try to recount at, at, for ourselves to help us actually do own our own data. I mean, you know, be part of owning the data, which means you don't have to go through tons of hoops and always feel that you're asking, you know, for, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, the. I mean, and I'm sure you've had the, the two types of situation in your life when you're collaboration and things like that. But what happened to make this possible? Can, can, is there a few factors? Or? I know that this is being recorded and I know that like there are a lot of people online, but I'm going to tell you this the true story. So I, I, I got my PhD in statistics and in my first collaborative meeting with a very famous cancer researcher, uh, he was talking about the data and I said, I really don't care. This is my X matrix and I'm going to sparsify it. So um, fortunately, people, the world is full of kind people and kind scientists. So he sat me down and said, Brumar, uh, the rows of this, this data metrics are my patients that I have been seeing. And then these columns are biomarkers that I've spent my entire career on. So you better pay some interest to what this X matrix is. So I think that sometimes we stay decoupled from data and mechanism, and I have come a long way. Um, and I think that one good thing about Michigan Genomics Initiative was that our Famous human geneticists are in the biostatistics department. So this was actually started by someone in the biostatistics department. Right. And you know, you talk to your colleagues more, right? So he was a part of this team. And Gonzalo came back and yeah. talked to us. It's Gonzalo, the yeah. So, yeah, exactly. so Gonzalo and I started talking, and he's and my way of thinking could be different. But I really got interested, and that's why I was part of cohort development, not really data analytics core. I wanted to see. And when you have this patient engagement studio. You see faces of people and they tell you that what research is influencing their lives and why did they consent to give all of their data, not being afraid of their privacy. And most of the time it is because <laughs> someone in their family was actually helped by the health system. And so that's why they want to contribute. So when you see this, you feel passionate. And then there were people in my department who said that 
you are becoming an epidemiologist. You'll never be able to publish a methods paper again. And you have to ignore that and find that strength that I find joy in this. And I'm going to go forward with this and I'm going to prove you wrong. And I'm not going to say who it was, but um, but I do think that the, there are these forces about what we value as statisticians. And I think that it has been a complete, like, you know, over 10 year, a long journey. It's not easy. And it's not easy for a person who is starting out without proving their methodological skills that rightly get into data collection. But at some point of time, if we actually are part of a team, and I'm very good friends with the two PIs. We, none of us could do it alone, uh, but uh, also uh, drinking regularly with your colleagues helps. So. <laughs> But also make the funding. It's a different system, and obviously, yeah. you the funding that you got was yes. kind of from cohort building. Yes, cohort building. Right. So it's particular. It's an NCI yeah. grant for cohort building, right? So it's a completely different right. grant that we try. Yeah. I come and just to echo what Sylvia was saying. I, I, I love this model of creating your own data, basically, because that's what we do in trial design. We try to create our our sample, you know, in influencing that collection as much as possible. But I do agree with Sylvia, it's an, a huge investment on, on spending time convincing to, to uptake and collect the data in a different way. Uh, and um, and, I, and I, I agree, we have to spend that time. It's just changing the mold from something that would be, say, equally randomized to something that's moving away from that may be worth it, but it's not going to happen just by publishing in a methodological uh, journal. It will it will happen by spending that time interacting with with the clinician, thinking of thinking about the patients and and so on. But I really I really like that 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 idea of thinking that we should influence more at the beginning, uh, at the design stage. Yeah, and and I might care, which is the study. Because it's also really talking about environmental injustice, and Michigan has been really laced with that, from Flint water crisis to that, to be able to directly influence some findings with a clean study. Because you know, prospective clean study, longitudinally collecting omics biomarkers is probably the cleanest way to get at the truth. What intermediate changes that you see, as opposed to EHR data, but you needed all of that expertise. Right now, we are going to you know, schools and churches and mosques in order to get people's buy-in to give so much data because they are not just patients in our healthcare system. It's a completely different ballgame. But at the end of the day, I think if you're part of this team, you feel very rewarded that you're closer to the truth. OK. Well, I think that this conversation will continue. Yes. For sure. <laughs> in the coffee room around all the very nice things you bring. And so let us thank Brahma. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to talk anytime. Thanks to all of those who joined online.